today about my next favorite greenhouse gas and methane. So we've already had a bit of an introduction to methane and I'm sure you guys all know something about methane at least. So starting with why are we interested in methane? Of course it is a greenhouse gas, it is very much climate relevant. This is the standard IPCC plot and you'll see that we have methane as the second most important well-mixed greenhouse gas. It has a not quite as long a lifetime as carbon dioxide. It's something like nine years or so in the atmosphere. Um, and partly because of that, it's easier to mitigate. So there's, you can do a lot more by trying to cut methane emissions quickly. So one molecule of methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than one molecule of carbon dioxide. Of course, there's much more carbon dioxide and the methane won't be here forever. But in the short term, trying to reduce methane emissions is a promising approach. Also, it's easier to reduce these emissions because we often don't emit methane entirely on purpose, right? To reduce carbon dioxide emissions, you actually have to burn a lot less, so become a lot more efficient or use a lot less energy or switch to a new um, energy source, which are all more difficult steps. Whereas often methane emissions, so anthropogenic methane emissions are things like leaks, leaks in gas pipelines, this kind of thing that we can actually do a fair bit to stop. Um, Garbage dumps emit a lot of methane when they're not managed well. So most garbage dumps in, in Europe have been remanaged so that they're either really well oxygenated or they're capped and they collect the methane and use it for fuel. There are a lot of things you can do to reduce your methane emissions if you know where they are. So, so I'm making it sound like methane's really easy, but methane's actually really complicated, but we'll get to that. So more at an understanding level. So as a bit of a historical background, and this I um, have to give credit to Martin Hyman, who is my, he's retired now, but he's my uh, director. Um, and he has worked in the field for a very long time and knows a lot about the first measurements and who was figuring things out first. So in comparison to CO2, methane came on the game rather late. The first documentation of the increase was from Bell Labs in 1980. And there's this interesting uh, data series that's a concentration change. And it just shows it's gone up by around 0.1 ppm, so that's like 100 ppb. Usually we think of methane in terms of ppb or parts per billion um, over about a decade, 1968 to 1977. I found this quite interesting. Also THC here is total hydrocarbons. It's not the other THC. Um, yeah, so this was relatively new that people realized this was happening. Um, there were some other previous measurements of methane. You'll see it's probably a bit hard to see on the screen, but this kind of orangish, yellowish area here um, were measurements mostly made in, in uh, Germany by different groups. So they were quite early measurements. The precision was rather poor. Um, they were just kind of trying to figure out if they could measure it at all. And what you see here is, of course, the famous leveling, but also similar to what we saw before with uh, CO2, there's a big interhemispheric gradient actually a much bigger interhemispheric gradient. If you remember what we saw for comparing Mauna Loa to the South Pole yesterday, here we have an interhemispheric gradient of like 100, 150 ppb um, between Alaska and Tasmania. It's not so different at the South Pole compared to Tasmania. So there's a very large interhemispheric gradient. Um, and what we saw yesterday with CO2 was that they were about at the same level, north and south, um, at the beginning of the, the curve, so around 1960 or so, and then the difference increased. And with methane, it's a little bit of a different story. If you go back to 1750, so this is extending the record with ice cores, we see that there's still a gap, yeah? So this, was, this is kind of where we like to think of as pre-industrial starting, and there's already a very significant difference between north and south. And I don't know if anyone wants to guess why, but... So there are natural sources of methane, of course, and most of these are in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have wetlands, and there's a lot of wetlands in the tropics, and then there's wetlands also in the far north. So we have more land and more methane sources in the Northern Hemisphere. And, oh, I thought there was one more going further back, but no, that's it, okay. 
Uh, oh, we do see, however, though, that the, the interatmospheric gradient does grow as the emissions pick up. This is roughly what the budget is made up of, and we heard this before from Sean in a slightly different form, but same story, more or less. Um, what we see is the natural sources here is about 40% of the budget, roughly. The anthropogenic sources are about 60% of the budget. The anthropogenic sources are things like fossil fuels. Here, biomass burning is classed as anthropogenic. It is, of course, a bit mixed. There's natural biomass burning, but a lot of it is also agricultural fires um, and fuel burning. And agriculture and waste. And agriculture and waste is a big one. Um, largely, this is ruminants, so meaning mostly cows, but also sheep and goats. So anything that has this sort of digestion where they they, have, they can break down cellulose with archaea in their guts, it's going to be belching out methane. They're not farting methane, they're belching methane. Um, so it's a very large source of methane that is largely human-driven. Of course, there are natural ruminants who are also releasing methane, but not in, in nowhere near the numbers of the cattle that we have for livestock. And it's, the budget's almost balanced. So this is what's going into the atmosphere, and this is what's coming out of the atmosphere. So the sink is almost the same size. So we have a budget that's something like on the order of 550 teragrams of methane per year. And the, the growth rate is something on the order of 8 teragrams per year. So it's pretty close to balanced, but not close enough. Um, this is also the budget from 2000 to 2009. Since then, the growth rate has increased again. So similar to the carbon dioxide problem that was kind of introduced yesterday, we have kind of similar looking curves, although I find this interesting that you can see this flattening even on this little cutout that is more than 200 years long. It's, it's that big a deal that it stopped increasing that you can see it even on that scale. Um, we use similar tools. We use top-down and inverse modeling. We use bottom-up process models. It also, both of them are a combination of anthropogenic and biogenic fluxes. We also require incredibly, almost impossibly high measurement precision and accuracy. Where the difference is, is that in carbon dioxide, at least on a global scale, we're able to say, okay, we know the anthropogenic pretty well, we know the oceans also fairly well, and then the biosphere is the most uncertain. In methane, they're all uncertain. So there's more components, and they're all very unknown. So we have too many unknowns. Um, this is a synthesis paper from Sonoa, and it has the top-down and bottom-up estimates of the different, the different categories. Um, wetlands, biomass burning, fossil fuels, agriculture, and waste, so, and uh, other natural sources. And what you'll find is a lot of things get lumped into other natural sources. Um, geological seeps, the numbers are all over the place in the literature. Part of it's an upscaling problem. You measure it here, and you measure it here, and you measure it here, and maybe you have one really big value, and you say, now I multiply it by my area. Sometimes that's not realistic because you, it, it's a very noisy signal. Um, there's a lot of sort of fat tail distribution in methane uh, fluxes, so it's, it's difficult to statistically upscale properly. Another complication compared to carbon dioxide is the chemical sink. Um, here we have three different versions of our OH fields that are all used in the literature that are all considered to be state of the art and consistent with everything that we know. They're all relatively different, and this changes where your sink is. I'll show exactly how much it changes later on. So there, there's uncertainty on this level as well. OH, the hydroxy radical, is really difficult to measure. It has an incredibly short lifetime. So it's so volatile that this very difficult measurement you can measure at one point in space and time, and that does not represent almost anything. So what we know, everyone agrees that it peaks sort of in the tropics, that's what we agree on. <laughs> and also what the, the seasonal cycle looks like. We have some additional constraints to it, but these additional constraints are mostly based on something called methyl chloroform. And this is what you see here, because this is something that has a very well-known lifetime with respect to OH. So we have measurements of this around the world, and we say, OK, if we can match the decay curve, then we think our OH fields are, are good. One of our problems is if you look at this curve, it's it's a pollutant and is very tightly controlled now and no longer produced in great amounts. Um, it's almost flat now. 
which makes it really hard to fit the decay to what OH fields are like now. So actually, the kind of atmospheric chemistry community is actively looking for another tracer that we could measure that would help us get a handle on OH. Because what worked pretty well 20 years ago to say, yeah, OK, we're matching the methylchloroform decay doesn't really work anymore, because this decay is almost flat. So this is kind of an open problem in atmospheric chemistry. So we've already talked about this a few times, but it was really quite a surprise why it stopped increasing. I remember when I was a graduate student and I was at an atmospheric chemistry meeting, a conference, and they were discussing this, and you know, there was some panel discussion, and an expert said, well, we know why. It's because the sinks match the sources. That's it. They didn't know which sinks and which sources had changed. All they knew is that now it was balanced, and they didn't know whether the sink had gone up or the sources had gone down, and if the sources had gone down, which sources had gone down. And it's still rather open, somewhat open as a question. Um, there was again a question, why did it, the increase begin again around 2007? And then the increase accelerated, sort of starting around, yeah, 2000, I, I thought it was 14, but it looks more like 16 on this graph. So similarly, we have a lot of measurements based on the ground. This actually looks like amazing data coverage, but all of these green lines are um, high altitude measurements from commercial aircraft. So again, they're, they're not giving you a lot of information about what's close to the surface. This is sort of at the, the tropopause. And these are all measurements. This is basically every measurement of carbon, that, um, or sorry, of methane that uh, my PhD student, Tanatio, was able to scrounge for his thesis. And adding GOSAT data to that increases the, the coverage, of course. So back to Skiamaki. So now we're going to talk about what satellites are bringing us. As always, they're going to bring us a lot of coverage, however, usually poorer precision on the instruments. And with methane, there's actually been a lot of activity and a lot of improvement. Um, so Skiamaki, I mentioned yesterday, had some serious signal degradation starting from around 2005 and kind of getting worse. But the first three years were really giving pretty great data um, for methane, great compared to what we knew before. However, compared to what we have today, it's relatively poor precision. Um, however, averaging over a year here, so this is the group in, in Bremen has done, and when you average over a year, hot spots pop out. Here you can see the Central Valley of California. This is uh, Four Corners, which is a big uh, natural gas source. And here in Central Asia, you can see that Turkmenistan actually has massive amounts of methane. And that, that still shows up today. That shows up in Sentinel-5P data. So this is, these, a lot of this is real. I also find it incredible how much this is bordered. The, the borders are really clearly marked. And this is in concentration space in the total column, but it's, it's that closely linked to where the flexes are. But you also see, for instance, over water, it, the measurement's more difficult, and over the Caspian Sea, it's quite noisy and probably not entirely realistic. So there's still a lot of noise in this data. There were also some significant bumps along the way, and this is just interesting because sometimes people who are not really in the field but kind of you know, read science and nature, and they're like, oh yeah, I know about methane. I remember that Kepler paper, and it's, it's bad. So there is uh, this science paper first, comparing the first data of Skiamaki to model runs with our sort of best guess forward um, fluxes, also constrained by surface data. And they look, the patterns are pretty close, but when you look at the difference, I mean, there's something going on in the tropics, right? There's something big going on in the tropics. This was exciting enough that it gets published in science. Okay. And then two years later? No, nope, one year later. One year later, Kepler publishes a paper in Nature and have an explanation. It's the plants. It's methane emissions from terrestrial plants under aerobic conditions. Usually we think of methane as coming out of wetlands when there's no oxygen. And they're saying, no, no, we think there's a mechanism, and the tropics is producing a massive amount of methane in under aerobic conditions. And then Christian Frankenberg published, they kind of went through, why are we getting these weird results? And uh, it was a spectroscopy problem. So there was problems with the water vapor spectroscopy in the Hytran database. And there's also a lot of water vapor in the tropics. So there's a lot of vegetation and a lot of water vapor. Um, the new line shapes basically resolve the anomaly. And I would point out that this got published in GRL, which is still good, but it's not science or nature. So <laughs> you should make big, exciting mistakes. 
So um, then we came to GoSat, which was, yeah, launched 2009. And this is the Japanese satellites measuring carbon dioxide and methane. And here we had uh, Skiamaki at the top, and here is two different retrievals of methane. This is from the Lester group, and it's a so-called proxy retrieval. And this is kind of a nice trick you can do if you're measuring both carbon dioxide and methane, because we consider the, car the carbon dioxide to be mostly flatter and more well-known. Instead of retrieving methane directly, they retrieve the ratio between methane and carbon dioxide, and then multiply it by a modeled CO2 value. So it's kind of like a little bit of a trick, it, but it means you can get a lot, a lot more data coverage. Um, because some of the problems, some of the problems like aerosol and light path issues disappear because they are the same for the, the methane and the carbon dioxide lines. So you, a lot of the, the difficulties that we have in a full physics retrieval get better. So this is quite a nice, it's a nice trick. Um, and this is a full physics retrieval, so it's more physically consistent. You're not using an external model that you th hope is correct. Um, but there are more gaps. There's more gaps with cloud cover, there's more gaps with aerosol, and also at higher solar zenith angles. You kind of need a better signal to noise and less in, uh, problems in your signal. And here we see that there's still kind of some problems in the measurements. This is a relatively early version of it, but I, this was a classic approach that was used by a lot of modelers. So we got these great data and we're like, okay, I'm gonna use it in my model. I'm gonna use it in inversion. And what most people found is that it didn't look at all like the atmospheric methane fields that they were starting from. Because you're hoping it's gonna help fill in the gaps, but when you find it's completely inconsistent with the information I have before, something's wrong, and mostly we assume, okay, it's a bias, there's a measurement bias. I don't know why, but there's a bias. So most of the time, modelers were using a model-specific bias. So what you do is first make optimized fields that match your surface measurements, and then you have this 3D field of concentrations, compare it to your satellite data, and then fit some sort of simple one or two parameter kind of curve to get them to agree better. So here's an example for Skiamaki that was used where it's just, it's fit against latitude and month. It's kind of hand wavy, but it made the agreement much better and it lets you use the data more. Interestingly, it could be correcting for errors in the satellite data or it could be correcting for model errors. We don't have this problem nearly as much for carbon dioxide, but methane has a few extra tricks. And part of that is the chemistry. So I mentioned before the different OH fields. And so these are all things, most of our models are not solving OH along the way and don't have full chemistry. It's too expensive to run full chemistry in the kind of iterative mode that we need for inversion. So we usually use some kind of chemistry that we think is right. And if I take these three, three different OH fields and run the same fluxes forward and sample it where I have GOSAT measurements, so I run my transport forward, then I get three different versions of reality reality. And I'm going to pick Spivakovsky here in the middle as my, my uh, reference case, because it's kind of a standard reference case. And I see, okay, so the difference between the OH fields, this is just the difference in the OH fields, gives me some sort of latitudinal gradient with season that looks kind of like the corrections that we're applying, the bias corrections on the data. And this is just the model. This is just model uncertainties in OH. So our bias correction might work, but it might work for the wrong reasons. Another thing that we could be doing wrong, and we know we're sometimes doing wrong, is uh, problems in the stratospheric component. This is also where methane is more complicated for us than carbon dioxide. So there's also a, a stratospheric sink. So this is sort of what is measured by a satellite. So this is MEPAS, which is a microwave limb sounder. So it's like looking through, this is the, the Earth, and it's looking through the atmosphere like this, cutting, cutting slices. Um, and it does a pretty good job of giving you stratospheric measurements, so really high in the atmosphere. And this is in, in PPB. So you see down here, it's around 2,000, which is sort of what we expect in the troposphere. This is the tropopause, this black line here. MEPAS cannot measure to the surface. This is just an upper atmosphere measurement. But we see it really drops down. It drops down all the way to zero, but there's this sharp gradient in the stratosphere. Now, this is what the um, CIFS looks like. This is sort of the um, ECMWF chemistry model, okay? 
And you see, okay, it looks pretty close, so they're doing things sort of right, sort of. Um, and then you take the difference, and the difference is massive. So there's not a lot of air up here, right? We're in the, the stratosphere, but you're looking at a difference of like plus or minus, plus and minus really, uh, 200 ppb. And so this was a study by a former PhD student of mine. And um, it, we're quite lucky in some ways that these are compensating errors. So if you're trusting the MIFAS measurements and you do kind of like a sum across the column, this is too high, but this is too low. So it almost works out. But then we end up getting kind of a bias correction that has to be applied that also has a seasonal dependence and a latitudinal dependence. And again, this looks like the bias correction we're applying to the satellite data. So which one is wrong? Are there, is the bias in the satellite data? Is the bias in our models? Is the bias in both of them at the same time, most likely? Um, so there's been some effort recently to get some more in situ stratospheric measurements using things like um, balloons, to um, an air core, it's an instrumentation that drops down and gives you nice um, high precision profiles so that we can actually try and get our models to match what's going on. But okay, now back to like the big story. This is just a story about how bad our models are and how we don't really know entirely what we're doing, but we still do it. So back to trying to understand the growth rate. A lot of people were thinking that this increase this new increase, could it be as a result of shale gas emissions? So this shale gas or fracking is a very hot topic, and in the US it was causing a lot of environmental concerns. And if you look at this timeline here of when the shale gas fraction of US natural gas production was increasing, it looks suspiciously like this curve, doesn't it? They even start going up at the same time. And so this was really looking, so people were looking for evidence that this was it. Can we see this in the atmosphere? And so Alex Turner said, I think I can see it in the atmosphere, using GOSAT data, but first using in situ data. Um, so he was looking at in situ sites. So first Billings, Oklahoma, that's kind of in the middle of the US. It's in an area that's not far from oil and gas production. And then Bermuda which is you know, in the ocean and far to the east, and so it's sort of downwind of the US to some degree. And saying, yeah, okay, first there was this sort of offset, but the offset was increasing over time. So this is the difference between the two. And you could even say it kind of looks flatter here, and then it's going up by 3.6% by per year. I mean, this is really some indication that there's more emissions coming out of an area that we know is related to oil and gas. And when we look at the GOSAT data, this is from the same paper, um, there's this bulge in, meth in the methane trend over the US. So this is not the total amount of uh, methane in the column, but this is actually the trend. So this is the change in methane per year, and you see that it's very positive over a lot of the continental US. Not specifically in the biggest oil and gas regions only, but in the shale regions it is. And so this was quite exciting it's not high over the parts of Canada where they're also doing fracking. But still, this looks really like something's going on. Like there's a lot of increasing methane emissions across the US. So then other people said, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's the fracking, maybe it's the oil and gas. So what other tools do we have to look at this? And one of the things we can do is look at stable isotopes. So I'm sure some of you have worked with isotopes, and I'm not gonna get into all of the, the processes, but basically sometimes, sometimes a molecule weighs a little bit more, and, or weighs a little bit less, okay? So they have kind of like this extra weight, so in this case, it's the, I'm looking at the, the carbon 13. So usually carbon weighs 12, sometimes it weighs 13, and then because of this difference in weight, different fractionation processes happen. So sometimes, for instance, in a biogenic source, the, the archaea that are producing methane will preferentially produce one version or the other, slightly different from their surroundings. So you end up with it kind of getting more of this isotope in one pool and less of this isotope in the other. So the differences in this, this fractionation tell you something about the processes. And what you see here, so this is the Del13C methane on this axis, is that the biogenic type sources, so things that are coming from the archaea, this is generally more isotopically depleted, so it's lighter, it's lighter methane, whereas biomass burning is heavier, so it has more of the, the 13C. 
and the oil and gas kind of fall in the middle. So this is kind of a tool that you can use to diagnose and say, does this agree with what we're seeing or not? And what happened at the same time is the methane was going up, our 13C methane was going down. And so if we go back for a second, hmm, so it's getting lighter. If it's getting lighter, that means that these guys are becoming more important. So a larger biogenic source, perhaps combined with a smaller pyrogenic source, but it's really not pointing to oil and gas. So this was interpreted in this paper by Schaefer as an increase in agriculture, so ruminants and manure management. So in the same year, using the same data, um, Nisbet et al. explained it a different way. So this is the same data plotted a slightly different way. Um, and I'm sorry that there's no label on this graph, but I assume that it is the change in this. I'm sorry about that. Anyhow, the same data were simultaneously published as being indicative of climate-related increases in tropical wetland emissions. Well, wetlands are also biogenic, so you can also kind of explain it with wetlands. And as you and Nisbet likes to say, a cow's stomach is a bit like a wetland, isotopically speaking. So it's the same kind of process. So the isotopes can't actually tell that apart entirely. And then just to mix up things more, or maybe it's the sink. Maybe the sink um, was actually just changing over these years. And this is the same Turner who, who had the GOSAT paper about why it was the oil and gas a year later published this paper about why it was the OH anomaly. And there's a lot of data on here. I'm sorry about that. But this is looking at methyl chloroform, saying, look, at, we can match methyl chloroform with a bigger or a smaller sink. Because as I said before, we can match methyl chloroform with almost anything now because it's pretty flat. Um, and looking at the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere data, they tweaked the, is it just a two box model, saying there's a little bit more methane, or um, sorry, OH, in the northern or southern hemisphere. And you can have different trends. And, match everything really, really well, and that this might be the most realistic. So saying, OK, yeah, the emissions went up, and the emissions leveled off during the leveling, but so did the OH. And then the OH went down, and the emissions went down, but the OH going down made the total amount of methane in the atmosphere go up. So even though the emissions were dropping, the methane was going up. So how do we resolve this? Obviously, using additional tracers help. I'm not talking about ethane today, but that's another kind of exciting thing people use to try and get at the oil and gas side of things. Um, but what could help is having greater spatial resolution in our measurements. And that's partly because if you look at these, these maps, we have different spatial distribution of where we think all of these fluxes are. Um, so this already gives us some idea. If we can say for sure, yeah, the fluxes are from here, so if I go at South America, for instance, the wetlands are largely distinct from the agricultural areas. Not entirely, but largely. And also here in Africa, we see that there's quite a separation between these two. However, when we have atmospheric measurements, they all get very, very mixed together. So it helps if you have lots of measurements over the area. So now we have tropomi. So on Sentinel-5, this is uh, the kind of the most exciting thing that's happened to me for a while. It launched in October of last year. Um, the resolution is about seven kilometers by three and a half kilometers. A swath of, so 2,600 kilometers, so very good coverage. It has a similar measurement concept to um, GOSAT, well, not GOSAT, actually, to Skiamaki, but um, it uses a nice slit homogenizer to deal with stray light issues and having such a wide swath, so it's quite, has some nice technological advancements. And the preliminary data look amazing. Um, the methane data are not yet public, so this is uh, from Klaus Zeno. Um, it just shows when the different data sets are sort of, were planned on being released, and so a lot of these are already available. If you're working on any of these species, you should definitely be downloading Sentinel-5P data right now. Um, yeah, and so methane should be coming soon, and we're very excited about that. But there is some sort of first, ah, oh yeah, just to show there's a lot of different species being measured. Um, the methane is over here, again, in the sort of near infrared. 
whereas most of the other, and the seal, and most of the other species that they're looking at are sort of air quality related and are in the, the visible UV. And how is this data resolution going to help us? If we look at a simple model plume of what 500 kilotons of methane, it's a big methane point source, this shows what Skiamaki would see and what Sentinel-5P would see with a single overpass. And already with a single overpass, this is based on pre-published results, but you can see, okay, yeah, there might be something higher there if I average some pixels together. One week of data, two weeks of data, four weeks of data. You could never see it with Skiamaki. You could average for months and it wouldn't have shown up. And GOSAT doesn't have the imaging capability. It doesn't actually give you the, the whole 2D picture. And so this is really opening up an entirely new kind of data for us to use. This is quite exciting. And this is just like the modeled version, but this is actually the real version and it looks that good. So um, this is the, some preliminary results over November, December, 2017. And over um, Africa, here you see the GFAS as a fire product that's also based on remote sensing data. It's a near real time fire product that really senses where fires are. And this is showing you where something is burning, where there's fire radiative power. And this is where the methane emissions are. And there's a pretty strong correlation. This is really exciting that we can get this level of detail. Um, they've also shared the first sort of level one data. So um, SRON is doing most of the, the kind of official processing testing, um, but they've shared the, the level one data with the broader community. And um, colleagues of mine in Bremen also you know, ran it through their, some, some test scenes through their algorithms. It's incredibly expensive to run because there's so much data, but um, they, they couldn't believe it. So this is one day over um, India. And it was, of course, some nice clear sky days. And this is only about a month after it launched a month and a half after launch. Um, and one day showed as many or more features as averaging multiple years of Skiamaki. So this was like one view. So this is really quite incredible. Um, CO is on the left and methane is on the right. Um, and what you also see in CO is that cities pop out of CO the way that we're used to seeing cities pop out in NO2. And the resolution and precision is so high that we're really gonna be able to get a lot more information. So I hope I made everyone excited about Sentinel-5P who's at all interested in atmospheric stuff. And of course, so back to separating processes. So even if we have this great high resolution information, we can still have pro problems to separate processes when they're completely co-located. Like here in the Pantanal region of Argentina, we see that there's wetlands and cattle farming in the same place. That's not something you're gonna easily be able to tell apart based on concentration measurements. Or a common site in the United States is uh, oil and gas with cattle, yeah? At least isotopically they're different. So, and ethane, they're different from the point of view of ethane. So, all right, so that kind of tells you what the state of the science is now, more or less. I will, just to say, the methane question is not fully resolved. There's kind of a growing consensus in the community that it's probably a combination of increasing biogenic and probably slightly decreasing anthropogenic at the same time, but that's, it's, it's coming together, so. Um, yeah, and now a look somewhat more forward, back to the sort of measurement concepts that we talked about before, and I said I'd get back to the, the active sensor concept, and that's in the context of Merlin. So this is another upcoming uh, methane mission, and this is kind of interesting because it's a technological kind of test case. It's never been done from space, this kind of measurement before. So it's an, a LIDAR measurement. So we have LIDAR in space, like Calypso that's measuring um, aerosol. Um, but this is trying to measure trace gases. So it can measure, because it has its own radiation source, it can measure during the day, at night, winter, summer, so it has its own radiation. And this opens up some scientifically interesting new terrain that we couldn't do previously. And I should mention, this is a, a French-German co-production. So Kness and DLR are working on this together. And I'm involved, so I'm not unbiased. Um, this gives an idea of the measurement concept. So 
the idea is that it's, it's very, very simple. There's different kinds of LiDAR that sometimes have scanning across a measurement line so th that have been tested for CO2. But this one is quite simple. There's only two wavelengths, one that's basically on a methane absorption line and one that's immediately next to it. And it's a carefully chosen line such that the absorption by things like water vapor and carbon dioxide are essentially identical at these two wavelengths very, very close together. And the only difference is the absorption by this one methane line. So any difference you see in the absorption between these two pulses is going to be due to methane. And so here it flies along, shoots down a laser beam, so a little laser pulse, it comes back up and is received in the transmitter. And these footprints on the ground are only about 100 meters across. So if you have a laser in space, when it gets to the surface, it's about 100 meters. Um, that means it's very small footprint, so it can measure in the cases of broken clouds, which is kind of nice. Um, but it has comparatively poor precision. So they'll be averaging a long track. But the benefit is that it has very, very low bias. And I mentioned before that systematic errors or biases are really bad for us. If you're trying to get to fluxes and you have biases, you get the wrong answer. So just to go back to what I said before was the biggest source of error for our passive remote sensing when we looked at things like aerosol contamination because we don't know the path length. Well, with LiDAR, we know exactly what the path length is because it's shooting a pulse and it knows when it sent it and when it gets it back. And we know how fast light travels. So we know exactly what the path length is. If something comes in the way, then it's a shorter path length, the pulse gets back sooner. If it's going through a cloud of aerosols, you're gonna get a very small return from the aerosols and a big return from the ground. So you know you want the big return. That means you've seen the ground and back. If you have very thick clouds, you can actually get a, you can use that as a hard target and get a return from the cloud top, which also means you can get partial columns. So you can get a total column measurement next to a partial column measurement, which we're still figuring out how to use, but I think holds a great deal of promise because it gives you some information about the profile. If you had both of these measurements next to each other, you could deduce from that what's in the planetary boundary layer. And if you had more measurements, say, at a higher level, you could say, okay, this is what the structure of methane looks like in the atmosphere there. So there's actually additional information. It might be harder to use. We have to be smart, but we're trying. And another reason why we're somewhat excited about trying to measure at high latitudes and in the winter, high latitudes, we often think of permafrost and permafrost melting, and will we see it when the emissions are starting? It's difficult. There's a lot of in-situ measurements, well, a lot. There are some in-situ measurements. They're very difficult places to work. Um, so there are in-situ measurements. And other satellites, even in summer, don't get very far north. It's just there's not enough light, and then the angles are really low, so it's a difficult measurement to make. And Merlin brings its own sun, so it can make the measurements and we're quite optimistic about this. And this is a nice paper from 2008 that during the international polar year, they did a bunch of extra polar measurements and said, oh, you know, we're gonna keep a couple of flux towers running all year round. Normally they don't. Normally they start them up sort of in the springtime and run them until it freezes up and say, okay, we measured our fluxes, now everything's frozen. And what this paper found was that at least some of the time, um, here, this, the, these black vertical lines are the flux measurements. This is when the ground freezes completely. So this is when we're at zero degrees. This is the zero curtain. And now everything is frozen. So also at 15 centimeter depth is completely frozen. And after, so the kind of accepted knowledge before was methane stops. And there's this giant burst of methane. And this giant burst of methane that no one had been measuring was half of the year's emissions at this particular flux tower. And no one had seen it because no one's making measurements in the Arctic in the winter at flux towers. It's really hard to keep them running all winter long. So this was quite exciting. And they actually then followed up by trying to measure a few more years. And it doesn't happen every year. It happens sometimes. It seems to have something to do with the season before and the snow cover. And it's very complicated. And we don't entirely understand it. But if we had something that was able to actually measure methane in the Arctic all year round, maybe we'd be able to understand it a bit better. Another thing that I'm not talking about that comes up a lot in discussions of methane is the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. It's this ocean shelf, so relatively shallow water um, north of Siberia, 
where there is a lot of methane coming to the surface, comparatively a lot. Normally, when methane is released under the water, it oxidizes in the water column, and by the time it gets to the surface, it's not methane anymore. It's been oxidized to carbon dioxide or dissolved into the column. So you don't, usually underground seeps of methane don't release very much to the surface unless they're in one of these very shallow areas and they're very big seeps. And this happens to be an area where there are big seeps and some is coming to the surface, but there's been some very controversial numbers published about how big this source area is. And from what we see in the atmosphere, it cannot be as large as the measurements that have been published. So this is why I'm not talking about it, because it's not that big. But we could measure it then and say it's definitely not that big. So, um, so also different from carbon dioxide, um, I mentioned before that it's relatively easy to mitigate. So these are kind of the low-hanging fruit from the point of view of climate change action. Um, reducing CO2 is difficult. We don't, reduce, we don't emit CO2 by accident. You're not just, oh, I forgot that I left that power plant running, yeah? Whereas methane actually sometimes is emitted by accident, so, and, it, and it's a fat tail problem. So if you can catch the super emitters, if you can stop the top 10% of, of emitters of actual point sources, you're more than 50% reduced your man-made emissions. So it's really, it's worth trying to find these hotspots. Um, so as, because of this, there's kind of a broader interest in trying to find anthropogenic methane hotspots. And this is something that's kind of a bit different for me as an atmospheric scientist, that there's actually so commercial and private satellites coming up or existing already that are focusing on methane. Um, one of the problems with this is that not all these data are publicly available, of course. So they're interesting, they're testing interesting measurement concepts, but they're not necessarily going to be of a great deal of use to non-commercial clients. So it depends on the, the case. So this is um, a Canadian company called GHGSAT, and they launched in 2016. Um, it's a different kind of measurement. It's a Fabry Pro spectrometer which I'm not going to describe in great detail, but it's a special one thing that they do that's different is it's an imaging Fabry-Pro spectrometer. So they kind of scan across an image and then can deduce where the, the high spots in their rings are and actually get a very high resolution picture. So high resolution, like 23 meters on the ground. So this is really high resolution pictures of methane. Um, and their field of view is 12 by 12 kilometers. But they're really aiming this not at they're not doing global mapping. They're going to specific points where they think there's going to be hotspots and getting an image, or more often, waiting until a company commissions them and says, could you fly over our pipeline? Because we want to see if we're having any leakage. And that's kind of what they're, they're aiming at. The data quality is a little bit problematic still, but it's, it's a, they're solving a different problem. So they're kind of looking at something like 10% uncertainty on the column, which is huge. I mean, that's like incredible. So if you have like 1800 PPB, they're saying, yeah, we can see a signal that's bigger than 180 PPB. This is a big signal. But because they're looking for relatively big leaks and also at super fine scales, then you know, by the time we can see it with something like Sentinel-5P, it's diffuse, yeah? So they're, they're able to see things because of this targeted measurement strategy. So they have one nanosatellite in space, it's 15 kilograms, and they have measurements. And they've actually shared a couple of their measurements. They are proprietary, but they, um, they've been coming to the IWGGMS, which is a meeting in our field, and they're nice guys, and they're looking for help in some things. So. Um, and this is one example they gave. It's uh, from the Lom Pangar Dam in Cameroon from last April. And I'm sorry I didn't convert this into a PPB. I did it once and the number wasn't massive. But you see that basically they measure almost nothing except for this really big hotspot. And it shows you this is where the dam is and they're seeing really, really, really giant methane emissions. So, and they also have sort of proprietary software that tries to estimate the, the fluxes from this. But this is just one. So there's also Bluefield. Um, and this is a, a private company based in California, working with some people from JPL. And um, they're using a different methodology. It's called gas filter correlation radiometry. And it actually looks like a pretty promising concept, and they've used it for other types of measurements in the past. And the difference images 
through a methane spectral filtering gas cell. So they kind of try and comb out what methane and what they're seeing. And they're, they're claiming a sensitivity of less than 1% natural abundance, which is much better. Um, and yeah, they're, they describe their sensor as being the size of a backpack, so I think we're probably also in the 15 kilogram region. But it hasn't launched yet, so this is kind of mostly still talk. Oh, I should also mention that um, GHGSAT, they um, also are making an airborne instrument to do similar types of stuff. So Bluefield is, is one. And then this one I found the most surprising and politically interesting, and this one perhaps will be public, actually. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a lobbying group, essentially, it's an environmental lobbying group, is building a satellite to try and find methane emitters. Um, they are working with scientists again, and they've raised funds from mostly corporate sponsors and private donors, and they're aiming to get a one kilometer resolution and global weekly coverage, which is really crazy. So I mean, that's gonna have to be at least a 200 kilometer swath, um, probably bigger, uh, at one kilometer resolution, and they're planning to launch already in 2020, but or 2021, or it'll probably be later because satellite launches are always later. Um, but this is really incredibly ambitious, but I also find it a very strange model of doing things. But I, I don't think they're trying to keep the, they're not selling the data. They really want to do this so that they can help emission inventories say, this is where your big methane emissions are, fix it. So, so yeah, that's my conclusions. So basically the methane budget is a badly under constrained problem. There's too many sources, too many sinks, too many unknowns. The anthropogenic and the natural sources and the sink are all pretty uncertain. So we know a lot, but, and our total methane budget is quite good, but our partitioning into who's doing what is not so good. I should, so I probably overplayed what we don't know. We do know the total budget pretty well. Um, we're hoping that Sentinel-5P will change the knowledge substantially. It'll also require us to develop some new tools um, for the inversions. And there's innovative types of remote sensing measurements on the horizon, both in terms of these super high resolution point source finders and also something like LiDAR that gives you no bias but no images. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? There must be some questions. Okay. Hi. Um, there's a thermal hyperspectral sensor which has been used in the US, I think, called HITES for detecting... I think it wasn't intended to be used for methane detection or trace gas, really, but they they flew it over a certain area and they discovered that there was a methane leak. Yeah. Um, they, they said that there was a certain amount of bands that had to be... Part of the reason it could be used was because it's had so many bands in the thermal infrared, and I don't think many others do. But uh, do you think, like, other thermal infrared sensors could be used? Okay, that's... that's an, okay, I'm not as familiar with HITES. I know Averis, which I think is a similar idea. It's a hyperspectral thing that they can fly on aircraft. And it's very high spatial resolution, too. Um, I think that would work. I don't think it'll work from space. Um, it's partly working because you're measuring in this relatively small, um, yeah, there's a small vertical extent. So everything you're seeing, you know it's right there, so you don't have the problems with the height as much. Um, and also the signal is much higher when you're flying lower. Excuse me. It's good to see you. Bless you. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, so I think that there are a lot of things that you can do from aircraft more easily than you could do from space. So that's, but I'm not 100% sure about this specific instrument. But yeah, I'm actually surprised that there's so much move towards commercial satellites because to me it seems way easier to do commercial, like do it on an aircraft, do it on a helicopter, do it on a drone. But I, so Bluefield is claiming this is much cheaper. I've never thought of satellites as being so cheap, but maybe when you're launching really, really small satellites, then, I mean, your launch costs go way down, and, yeah. So. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Uh, I have a question regarding the, like, so there have been quite a few publications recently on um, how, like, based on modeling, how methane affect the carbon budgets we still have to reach certain climate targets and, and so on and so on. And now after this talk, I'm, I'm just thinking how, I don't know, because it seems to be very hard to validate those models. It's mainly land surface models who kind of try to, to capture all the, the kind of the interactions and, but how, how do we validate those models if actually we don't really know mm -hmm. anything or very little about the sources? Um, yeah, so the thing is, we know for sure how much methane is in the atmosphere. Like that part's really certain. And we are pretty sure, like there was very little uncertainty what the global growth rate is and what the global budget is. What we have trouble with is saying exactly what share belongs to this category versus that category. And that does make it hard if you say, okay, we're going to make an active effort to reduce methane emissions from agriculture. And then maybe the methane emissions level out, or maybe they even go down, but can you prove that it was really from the agriculture? Can you prove that it's working? And that, I think there is, there is a bit of a, a gap there. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily a modeling gap as much as a, a measurement gap, if you can find a way that you can really measure the process that you're going after. Okay, so if, if we try to project like the, the effect that methane has on our climate, it wouldn't be necessarily a partitioning problem. Yeah, that's not a partitioning problem at all, right? It doesn't matter where the methane came from in terms of its global warming potential. It matters that there's too much of it. So. But it's easier to act on, on this knowledge that there's too much of it if you can say there's too much of it from this industry and this we can make smaller. So... Yeah, so I, I would say the uncertainty on the climate driving part is actually pretty low, but it's the partitioning that we really struggle with. So. Okay. Um, just a very quick question. Yeah. What about in situ measurements? Because if maybe that can resolve some, to some extent the ambiguities, whether there's you know, too much coming from oil and gas or from agriculture or from other... Yeah, so it, <laughs> we had the in-situ measurements before and we were hoping that the satellite would fill in the gaps because the gaps are too big to still to separate the, the shapes. And one of the problems we have is that there is not a lot of measurements in the tropics. This is an, always a problem, right? So this is where we know there's a lot of tropical wetlands. Um, amazingly, so the, the wetlands, it's like, there's a world of, of uncertainty there. So like how the inundation maps are wildly uncertain and most people agree that you know, they're using something that's too small or too big here. So we have these bottom-up models that often don't get the, the seasonal cycle right when we do have measurements. So I, th I think we need more measurements that we can actually trust our process models a little bit more and that might help. But yeah, of course, if you're doing a lot of measurements really in and around a gas field. That's something that's quite doable because this is a very, you know, high, highly developed place with infrastructure. That should help. Measuring too close to a source is also difficult because it's if you have this very big plume, but if you're close to it, then you see it or you don't see it. And you end up getting a very noisy signal that's not so easy to interpret. So it's, I don't have the full answer. It's not easy. Yeah. So. Anyone else?